Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I'll tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is, Entire Susan and Candy Saga I went from being a chump to a champ while working for a company for just under 15 years, and I was practically tripped at the finish line. I have given this organization my all because I believe in it and in the last two to three years because I would be working in a high-level position. The promise made me go back and finish my MBA because I knew the job would be very lucrative for the remainder of my anticipated career. In summary, it didn't occur, at least not for this particular scenario. Unbeknownst to me, Susan, an outsider who was not employed by the company, had been quietly positioning herself as the ideal candidate to take on the role that I had been pursuing for the CEO and board of directors for approximately a year. Industry news spreads when someone is approaching retirement age. When I say that I was working towards this position, I mean that the person who had it began to demonstrate to me what their responsibilities were, how to perform their specific tasks, and asked me to take on key responsibilities in their absence. To get the hang of things, I even collaborated with their VP on a few of these projects. It was meant for me to be able to do it so that I could be hired easily and fit in straight away. More about that in a post later, but... Ultimately, Susan was hired and took over as my boss. Although they possessed the necessary skills for the job, they lacked the ambition of the person they were replacing. In addition, I was already trained and familiar with the majority of Susan's responsibilities. When you factor in that I had an MBA just for the job and my now salty behind, it all felt like a huge waste. Even worse, I found myself needing to demonstrate several tasks to Susan. Later on, this will be crucial. Regretfully, Candy, Susan's acquaintance and distant relative, was employed by my company. Candy was a prickly one. Good disposition, but how do I phrase this? Not capable of sharpening pencils. Candy wasn't stupid. Rather, she lacked competence. She lacked self-assurance, tangible abilities, and required assistance and hand-holding for each task given to her. Before she felt comfortable entering data into Excel on her own, she had to practice for well over a year, and even then she would make mistakes and need assistance from a number of sources. Candy, who was employed in her late 30s, had no idea how to write a letter or address an envelope. Susan requested that she create a promotional flyer using these bullet points for a brief internal update. The flyer was to be cute and one page in length. Before asking for assistance from less experienced staff, she worked on it for two full days. She was unable to carry out any routine office task. She received the same kind of praise you would give a two-year-old for peeing in the toilet rather than in their trousers when she succeeded in finishing simple, easy tasks. Worse, there was a job in the corporation that was like Susan's vice president, just different. In order to keep things running when Susan was on vacation, the VP could take care of basic tasks. However, they also had a distinct set of responsibilities that nobody else could perform, which, remember, Susan should perform in the event of the VP's absence, but she never would because they were difficult and she wasn't ambitious. VP and I were good friends and close co-workers. After 27 years of employment, they wished to continue for another 7 to 10 years, but they were waiting to see how Susan, the new manager of this division of the business, fared. Susan was employed for two years until the vice president retired. The vice president advised me to apply for their position, saying that if I was competent for Susan's work, I could certainly perform their duties. The vice president advised me to accept it for the time being only for the wage increase, because I had something else to put on my resume, even though I didn't want to do it because it felt like a smack in the face and I didn't want to get complacent. I applied because excellent VP offered excellent advice. Of course... Susan urged Candy to apply. 
and I overheard her boasting to a fellow colleague that Susan had promised her the job, but that Susan would only go through the motions to appease irate employees like me. To cut a longer tale short, Candy was hired. To sum up, I was not only passed over for Susan's post, which I had worked hard for, but been showed how to perform the duties and had an MBA to accomplish, but I also didn't get the best candidate for the vice president position. It's worth noting that Candy was not the only employee to apply for the vice president post. There were other qualified candidates. Out of all of the applicants, she was simply the least qualified. I was always off for the whole story of Susan and Candy. I started sending out resumes as soon as Susan was employed, and I only increased my efforts when Candy was given a promotion. I discovered my ideal job, a role similar to Susan's at a different organization. Susan also happened to notice that this post was open, but she wasn't interested because, in theory, it wasn't a promotion. Rather, she told Candy to apply because it would be a big step up for her, and a big step up for me. I left that interview feeling like I did a great job, only to see Candy waiting in the reception on the day of the interview. My interview was scheduled directly after Candy's. I later learned that the interviewers were looking for differences between two employees of the same organization. Candy was not taken into consideration for the role. In the end, I was chosen as one of the two finalists. I gave my two weeks notice, returned to work, and departed. The main point of the narrative is that Susan was able to sell herself and exude confidence, which is how she was hired in the first place. Recall that I mentioned before that when Susan was recruited, I had to teach her how to play a few roles? My main responsibility was being an IT person. I took care of all aspects of the business's IT, including networking, troubleshooting, and server installation. It's a full-time job to start, but throughout the years I've taken on and been given extra responsibilities that are more equivalent to the occupations of two or three people. I've always persevered through them because I was working toward the position that Susan had accepted. I had to teach Susan how to do things in the little time that I had left. I had to take a few days off to burn time and get things up for my new employment. For those of you in IT, I was wrapping off a major project that involved updating every employee's PC. Although I was about 85% finished with this position, there were still several apps that required complex configuration or server setup, which I never got around to. In addition, there may be minor glitches that require hours to locate and resolve, sometimes only taking minutes. I did the best I could with the instructions, saying you would probably need to contact support. I provided the number to a business that I'm familiar with. Nevertheless, Susan kept telling me that she could solve the problem, and it wasn't a big deal. She would never show that she couldn't manage things. After a month or two, Susan gives a call to say hello, congratulates me on my new job, and strikes up conversation to find out how things are going, etc. As we're coming to an end, she says that she would be pleased to provide me with advice and assistance if I never needed it. She didn't find any information in my notes, by the way, but do I know where that particular piece of information is kept? What's the server's password? How do I get back into that remotely? While she's at it, were there instructions available on how to make an antiquated program function properly with another application? Hey, do you believe our security cameras are disconnected because half of them quit working? Not really anything significant, but something I could know offhand. As I mentioned earlier, I wrote down all of the passwords, network ports, specifications, and various configuration steps, but a lot of it was simply a common sense learned on the job. Oh, okay, I'm sure it's right here. Thanks anyways, good luck. Let me know if you need any help, stammered Susan. After six months, my new job is doing fantastic and is much better than it appeared on paper. It also provided me with the potential to progress. One day, one of my pals who works for IT support businesses mentioned to me that she used to be friends with Susan. Oh, may I ask? They claimed that Susan had contacted them four to five months prior in need of assistance putting up their equipment. 
They were informed that the person they hired to set up the computers did a shoddy job, leaving them with a disorganized and hardly functional equipment. According to the statement, Susan set up a contract with the business and has been one of their busiest customers ever since, seeking to solve problems. They currently receive a respectable salary from the business. I occasionally run into former coworkers or clients at the company. I also handled some project management. I've been told that things have changed significantly in trying to resolve issues, that there are terrible IT problems, or that there are more difficulties now that my position was left unfilled and other people have smaller responsibilities. It seems that a lot of people aren't content, and some of the others with whom I was employed left to work somewhere else. This was all done years ago. I occasionally run into Candy or Susan because of the industry I work in, and they tell me just how fantastic things are going. Yeah, it always ends up... It's always the people pleasers, man. You know, you would think that the people who run a company based on competency, like getting stuff done, would realize that perhaps the people who should be at the top are people who actually get stuff done and not people who just say that they'll get stuff done. But uh, for whatever reason... People continue to hire managers or people in higher up positions that they have no tangible anything to show for their ability other than their ability to talk about it. And man, it's just, it's such a shame. It's really such a shame. I get that it's hard to scrutinize someone just based on, you know, resumes and the like. But you'd think that for those kinds of positions, you would bring someone in for an interview that would like simulate what they would need to do not just ask them questions about what they think they can do. And I feel like if you went through that kind of more rigorous process, then you would figure out pretty quickly just by watching that person work and their ethic and their ability to ask questions and the like, what kind of person they are and if they really are the kind of dedicated hard worker that they say they are. The next story is, the local Karen is so strange. When I was 23, I inherited a house, and for some reason, the local housing association, which has nothing to do with me, did not believe it. You might say, what do you care if someone believes that you're the real owner of your house? I'll answer you. I live in a part of our land where it happens that someone can just walk into your house while you're not at home, and then it'll be very difficult for you to evict them from your house. I think many people have already realized which country I'm talking about, but I'll try to hide the exact area of the country. Karen, the local boss in this neighborhood, when she saw me, said that other people have been living in this house all the time, so why the am I on the property? I explained to her that my uncle died, but my uncle was single, so my father got the house. My father did not need this house, so he gave it to me. In fact, I became the sole owner of this house. They didn't believe me and said that I was just occupying the house and that I would regret it because there was a very nice woman who lived in the house and everyone liked her. It was funny to hear that because my uncle lived in the house and neither I nor my father had heard about him living with anyone for many years. I tried to find out what exactly was going on here and they told me that in general, young people like me never become house owners, to which I said once again, I inherited this house. And to be honest, I really could not have even earned such a house at the age of 23, but I repeat, I inherited it. And I'm not even a part of the HOA to be treated with this kind of attention by representatives of the HOA like this. Perhaps in some countries, in a, such a situation, it would be good to just keep silent, but that's not so in my country. Although they wouldn't have kicked me out of this house, even if I had just moved in without permission, they could have easily started to spoil some part of my life. I didn't want that either, so I spent a long time explaining to these people that this is my house now. It was completely legal. They did not believe me. The local HOA officers came running, and because of their boss's screams, they thought that there was some kind of fight. The officers turned out to be much more adequate people. 
I called my father to bring him the documents to confirm what I was saying. Unfortunately, our family home is very close to this house. I think Karen would have eaten her tie if she had one after she saw the documents that confirmed every word that I said. The next story is Carnival Justice. So, I used to work for a traveling carnival, the kind of ones you would see in a nearby parking lot, state, or county fair, or other event, one week and gone the next. To put some background information in order, I worked as a ride operator, which involved helping to set up, operate, take down, and store all of the show's electrical wire. To operate rides, there are tiers. We referred to these as green help, or fresh hires, as well as more experienced staff members. The brake person was responsible for providing brakes, while the supervisor oversaw the ride operators for the big rides and the kid family rides. Finally, the main event. I worked as a ride operator on a ride named Silver Streak. If you've ever been on a ride called Himalaya, this one is similar, but it only has one trailer instead of two or more. Additionally, there are height restrictions for each ride. This is significant to the plot. As the Silver Streak operator, I welcomed individuals in and made sure they had wristbands or tickets. Suddenly, I hear the exit gate open and then forcefully close. I had to excuse myself from the entry gate to deal with the folks going the wrong way after realizing who it was. I asked the woman, I use this term very, very loosely, if she could get off the ride and enter in the proper manner. This is the Uber Karen's moment to shine. She informed me that the queue was too lengthy for her, hubby, and their four children, all of whom were, I assume, less than seven. I informed her that I would not tolerate anyone avoiding the crowd at the entrance. I don't care about any of them. My kids and I are going to ride this ride, she exclaims and she turned her head away snobbishly. The spouse did not respond when I stared at him. I proceeded to the entrance and informed the others waiting in line that there was a delay because someone had entered the wrong way and was refusing to move. Thankfully, they all understood. I attempted to contact my manager and supervisor, but was unable. I asked the three police officers who happened to pass by to come over, and they complied. I informed them of the issue in the location of Karen and her group's seats. Two police officers, one for Karen and one for her husband, proceeded to speak with Karen. They informed me, in typical Karen language, that Karen is on the fair board, that she knows the state senator, and that she would have both the officers and my jobs. I informed the authorities that I would like to have her and her company to be removed from the ride if they did not comply with my orders to leave and arrive in the proper manner. Karen makes the decision to just sit there with her family, without moving. I thus manage to contact my unit manager and inform him that, indeed, we do have a code for Karen. After I explained the problem to him, he arrived and requested them to leave, when I apologized to the people in the line for the delay, they remarked, You don't have to be sorry, you're just doing your job. Karen becomes even more upset when my unit manager arrives to follow my, the ride operator's, instructions and leave and return in the proper manner, but she naturally refuses to comply, uttering phrases like, I refuse to follow the directions of some backwoods trash hillbilly. The operator is only a native of Dallas, Texas, which is where I was born and reared, my unit manager informed her. She continued despite that. We monitor the rides every day, and every two weeks, state inspectors come in to check them out. She actually called the police to arrest me and my manager for child endangerment since the rides are dangerous. At last, my manager lost her patience. He warned Karen and her group that if they don't get off that ride and head for the exit in the next five seconds, the cops will forcefully remove them. In addition, there were two state troopers and eight police officers present. After five seconds, you can probably guess what Karen does. She does not move one inch. My boss then requests that the woman and her party be politely and forcibly removed from the entire carnival. 
not just my ride, but the entire dang thing, by the 10 police officers. Naturally, Karen was shouting and kicking us for being horrible people and not allowing the kids to ride the rides, but no one paid attention because my ride was now the carnival's main attraction. It appears that she has previously operated a major ride or another ride operator. Everyone joined in on hit the road, Jack, and na 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 hey, 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 goodbye, when a ride with tight height restrictions began to play. Although she and her group were led to their vehicle, Karen committed two fatal errors. She then proceeded to kick three police officers, strike two state troopers, and choose to spit on a fourth one. When they, Karen and her family, got off the ride, I returned to running the ride and my manager told me all of this. I asked my manager if I could extend the next two rides past their schedule times without charging them for the four tickets each ride, and he accepted both offers. After Karen left, the riders had a terrific time thanks to the free rides and lots of laughs at her expense. A few weeks later, Karen decided to sue my manager and myself for emotional anguish, so we had to appear in court. Not only did my manager and I show up, but so did every single peace officer. Two state troopers and eight city police officers also gave testimony. Nine people testified on what transpired after she exited my ride, while I testified about what happened on the journey. Since the carnival was held on state land, she was found guilty of criminal trespassing, attack on a peace officer times 10, attempted assault on a peace officer times 10, assault with intent to hurt times 10, and resisting arrest times 10. She was given 70 years in prison without the possibility of release and was placed in the excellent Gatesville Women's State Prison, run by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. She filed an appeal, but she was unsuccessful all the way to the Texas Supreme Court, where she was defeated 5-0. to zero. It goes without saying that one Karen is off the streets for a very long time and good riddance. People, always keep in mind that don't mess with Texas, or its law enforcement, or you will pay dearly. Oh yeah, this is one of those stories that you're going to be keeping in that back pocket for the rest of your life. You're going to be telling your grandchildren about these stories. I mean, there's not much else to say other than, yeah, good riddance. People like that are completely obnoxious and have no place in a functioning society. Get them out of here. And I think uh, behind bars for 70 years, you know, assuming she makes it, um, maybe she'll learn a lesson or two. And uh, hopefully this stands as a warning to other people to wisen up a little bit and maybe be a little bit more polite in the way you go about things in public places. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.